Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with another Victober video. And this video was inspired by one of the prompts for Victober this year. Uh, so one of the prompts is to read a popular Victorian novel. And this can be interpreted in many different ways. It could mean popular today, popular on booktube, or it could mean popular at the time, but maybe something that we don't think of so much nowadays. And that was the part of the prompt that really fascinated me. Uh, so I have been looking at my TBR, I've been looking at my Goodreads, and I have been trying to suss out which Victorian novels that I have on my TBR were more popular at the time than they are now, or are essentially, let's say, kind of forgotten books. Last year, I read Studies in the History of the Renaissance by Walter Pater, and this is a nonfiction work about the Italian Renaissance, and it's kind of structured as being written in multiple different essays about certain pieces of art, uh, which I really enjoyed, and it is something that, weirdly enough, uh, is still talked about in certain circles, in Renaissance study circles in particular, but it is not something that has been in the popular consciousness in a very long time. And Walter Pater also actually wrote a historical fiction book called Marius the Epicurean, I believe, that is set during the Roman Empire. And it was very, very popular at the time. Walter Pater in general was a very popular author in the later Victorian period. It was really fun to me last year when I picked this up to have several people tell me that they had never heard of this before. And so when I looked into it, I discovered that this book was a favorite of Oscar Wilde's because there is quite a bit of it that is focused on the aesthetic of art versus kind of the more academic meaning of art, which I think is really interesting and clearly would appeal to somebody like Oscar Wilde. And I think this also kind of moved around the pre-Raphaelite circle a little bit. And so I just think it's interesting how certain books were clearly very, very popular at a time, but they are no longer popular nowadays, which makes me kind of want to examine our current bestseller culture. There are a lot of books that are clearly bestsellers now that will not stand the test of time. And it makes me curious about which books will stand the test of time. So I decided to look at my TBR and see what might go alongside Walter Pater as something that was really big in the Victorian age, but is not so much now. Somebody who I've come across in my studies of the Romantics has been John Ruskin. And so he is a Victorian writer, but he is also an art critic, which I think is really fascinating. And I very well may have found him through Walter Pater. Walter Pater, in a weird way, also kind of qualifies as a later Romantic. But John Ruskin really does. And there's quite a bit of his work that examines art. He traveled a lot through, I think, France and Italy. Uh, he was writing guidebooks to these areas and ways to examine the art, how to study their art, which I think is really fascinating. These were really popular at the time. This is one that I can see did not stand up against the sands of time very well because art criticism itself and the side of art study that is almost formatted like a guidebook that is designed a little bit more for travelers and academics when they are going to see certain art pieces in museums. Uh, that is a very fast moving industry. It moves very quickly and you become outdated very quickly as a result of that. Uh, so this is something that I can see probably it didn't last very long, even in its own day. But I find the study not only of art, but of art criticism very, very fascinating. And so I think it would be interesting to read his writing and his observations on certain art pieces. Uh, so he is definitely on my TBR. And I believe there is an Oxford World's Classics edition of his writing. Uh, so luckily, it is something we can still get our hands on in print. But he is definitely a fascinating figure. And I would actually like to read a biography of him. I think he's a very, very interesting person as well as writer. An author who was massively popular in the Victorian period is uh, somebody called Edward Bulwer Lytton, and I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but the book of his mainly, I have several books of his on my TBR, but the book of his that I think was probably the most popular uh, is Last Days of Pompeii. So this is a historical fiction novel set during 
the last days of Pompeii uh, before Mount Vesuvius blew. And so this was incredibly popular at the time and Edward bulwer Lytton wrote so much historical fiction. He's talked about a little bit as an inheritor of Sir Walter Scott, which I think is interesting because Sir Walter Scott has definitely stayed a little bit more prominent in my opinion. Certain works of his have anyway, but I think this is a little bit more of a kind of a pop culture take on historical fiction. I think that Sir Walter Scott may have been a bit literary and this is a little bit more adventure fiction, I think, which really fascinates me. I have yet to read anything by Edward bulwer Lytton, but this is the one that I think is the most popular and is the one that I am the most intrigued by. Uh, so he had so, so many books akin to this set in different historical periods. And I would just love to read him. I would love to try him. In fact, I wish I had chosen one of his books for the popular prompt this year because I just think he seems like a writer that I would really like. And I would be curious to know down below if you have read anything by him or by any of the authors that I'm going to talk about today, but he seems to have been fairly prolific and very, very popular. Uh, so he's one that I'm shocked didn't stay more popular, if that makes any sense. I have a couple of pieces of nonfiction uh, on my TBR that were written in the Victorian period by really popular authors. This is one of them. This is Thomas Carlyle's The French Revolution. And this book was incredibly popular reading at the time that it was published. This book, I think, also is the one that Charles Dickens read mostly for his research uh, on the French Revolution when he was writing A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, and this is akin to the art criticism of John Ruskin, historical research goes fast. Uh, so much about historical nonfiction writing is outdated because as the years go on, we discover more about a period and we also start interpreting history in different ways as the years move on. And so how he is examining the French Revolution is probably not what we would do today. Uh, so this is something that probably in his own lifetime, historical scholarship moved past. I've said this before and I'll say it again. When I was a history major working on my history degree, we were told never to use nonfiction in our papers that had been published more than 10 years previous. So anything older than 10 years is a good bet. It's probably outdated uh, in terms of certain historical scholarship. The French Revolution, definitely, because it's a very popular topic. But I think this has remained a classic largely because of its really beautiful lyrical writing. There's a very poetic style to Thomas Carlyle's writing. And it's one of the first big kind of behemoth works on the French Revolution in English. And so this is one that has been on my TBR ever since I heard about it. And I think I will really enjoy it. Thomas Carlyle is kind of forgotten about nowadays, but I think he should definitely be discussed when we're talking about how times have changed in terms of historiography, kind of moving on from Edward Gibbon on up through the Victorian age. I think Thomas Carlyle should be discussed. Uh, so this is one that is very high on my TBR. Another, by an author that you will have heard of, uh, is The White Company by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And this is a more forgotten classic that I think it's a real shame. When you do some reading on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he firmly believed that his historical fiction writing was what was going to stick around and what was going to make him popular and not Sherlock Holmes. And he got to the point where he hated Sherlock Holmes because writing him kept him away from writing the projects that he really wanted to write, which I think is really sad. But The White Company uh, is one of his historical fiction outings. It is set during the Hundred Years' War in France, uh, and it sounds like so much fun. It sounds like a real romp. It sounds as if it's in kind of the vein of Ivanhoe because apparently it deals quite heavily with the ideals of chivalry, which I think is really fascinating. I think I'm really going to enjoy this. I tried Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, Sherlock Holmes series last year and was not a big fan of it at all. And multiple people told me that I should try his historical fiction because that was actually his baby. Uh, that was the thing he was really the most proud of. And I think I probably will in general get on better with his historical fiction than his Sherlock Holmes series. But it's interesting to think about 
such a popular author having several books that have kind of fallen by the wayside across time. And this is one of those. I think that's really interesting. So this is one that I am definitely looking forward to trying. I'm not really sure if it's something that qualifies as really popular at the time, but has gotten forgotten over the years because it seems to me that apparently at the time, Sherlock Holmes was what was selling for him and this was not. Uh, so maybe this is just kind of a sleeper hit. This is just a really quiet book in terms of his career, but it was one of his favorites. Uh, so this is one that I am really looking forward to trying. Another big historical fiction writer in the vein of Edward bulwer Lytton is William Harrison Ainsworth. And this year I saw that Tori from Hufflepuff Discovery, I will link to her channel down below, I saw she was reading a book called The Lancashire Witches. And this is by William Harrison Ainsworth. And he is another who was apparently incredibly prolific and apparently incredibly popular in his own day. He wrote a lot of historical fiction and a lot of his books sound intriguing. This is the one that I think intrigues me the most, uh, mostly because Tori is picking it up and I want to know what Tori thinks about it. But this is about an actual thing that happened, a real phenomenon, I believe, that happened with a certain family up in Lancashire in the 1600s, I believe, which sounds really fascinating. But he has other works that are set, I believe, around Old St. Paul's. He has a book called Old St. Paul's that is telling about the plague, I believe, before the Great Fire destroys Old St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, so he has a lot of books that sound really interesting to me. This is one that I think I would probably get to first because I've heard more about it. Again, this is one that I think is interesting. I always think it's interesting to see people who were apparently bestsellers and who had several books that clearly sold very well, that people clearly loved, but we have largely forgotten about them. And I wonder what differentiates a person like William Harrison Ainsworth from someone like Charles Dickens. Uh, so that's always fascinating to me. Uh, so I'm hoping to try him soon. Another piece of nonfiction kind of going hand in hand with the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle is The History of England by Thomas Macaulay. Now this has not gone out of print. It's also still very, very popular uh, in certain segments of the history community to my understanding. Uh, so his History of England focuses in, I believe, on the 1600s and 1700s, which is really interesting. Uh, and it's apparently very beautifully written. It was a very instrumental text at the time. It was a very famous text and it is still used in schools, I believe. Uh, so this is one that maybe actually doesn't qualify because it does seem like, in certain circles anyway, it's still a very popular book. But from my perspective, Thomas Macaulay as a person is far more famous than this work is. Uh, so I know quite a bit about Thomas Macaulay kind of as a historical figure, more than I do know anything about anything that he wrote. Uh, so this is one that fascinates me and I would like to read it because I have sampled some of his writing before and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And if I can be promised more beautiful writing like that, I'm pretty sure I'm going to really enjoy the history of England. Last but not least, a book that is on my TBR is Ziska by Marie Corelli. And this is a supernatural thriller type of book that came out the same year as Dracula. And so it also came out the same year as The Beetle by Richard Marsh. The Beetle by Richard Marsh is kind of a mummy type book and it outsold Dracula actually at the time of its publication. I believe Ziska is also an Egyptian inspired supernatural tale and it also sold incredibly well that year. So this was a year with three massive supernatural hits. And I would love to read Ziska to kind of compare the three of them together because it just sounds like a really interesting time, a really interesting year. So we talk a lot today about publishing trends and how suddenly everybody is writing a vampire book. Suddenly everybody is writing about aliens. Apparently there were publishing trends even in the Victorian period and everyone was writing a supernatural tale in 1897, 1898. But this is one that I think sounds really great. I think sadly The Beetle as well could go here, but Ziska and The Beetle must be completely overshadowed by the fame that Dracula eventually got. Uh, so this is one I would love to read and I hope to find out very soon if it's really good.
I would love to know if you have read any of these down below and if there are any kind of popular Victorian novels that were popular at the time, but not so much nowadays. If there are any of those on your TBR that I have left out, I love hearing about these lesser known books. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Happy Victober. Goodbye.